morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Willie LeBreton, and I currently serve the college as its provost and dean of faculty. Before I became the provost, I was the chairperson of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and one of the hires I am most pleased that we made was that of Dr. Daniel Lorison. Daniel was an undergraduate here at Swarthmore, where he was a sociology and anthropology major. I even have the honor of claiming him as one of my students. After working at nonprofits in Swarthmore and in Philadelphia, Daniel went on to study sociology at the University of California, Berkeley, and then again onto a postdoctoral fellowship at the London School of Economics for three years before returning to Swarthmore to join us as an assistant professor of sociology. Since then, Daniel has been promoted to associate professor with tenure. His interests include class, inequality, stratification, and mobility, political participation and engagement, and American politics. He is also the associate editor of the British Journal of Sociology and has been excuse me, and has won one of the country's most prestigious awards, a Carnegie Fellowship from 2021 to 23. In Professor Lorison's own words, he says, I approach all my projects with an interest in how the world looks different to, different, to people in different social positions and with a commitment to taking seriously the deep connections between economic inequality racial inequality, and racism. The joke is, and it may only be lore, that in graduate school, uh, Daniel watched a lot of reruns of the television show Hawaii Five-0, and he took to heart Steve McGarrett's injunction, book him, Dano. But he misinterpreted that and began writing books. He has written two books so far, producing politics inside the exclusive campaign world where the privileged few shape politics for all of us, and the class ceiling, why it pays to be privileged. Daniel is one of those social scientists who appears to be afraid of learning nothing new, and so he draws on whatever methodological tools will help him to best answer his questions from in-depth interviews to large-scale surveys, and from data visualizations to regression models and multiple correspondence analysis. And he is truly good at each of these. It is a rare and extraordinary experience to know someone as a student and then to welcome them back as a colleague. Already, Daniel has taught me so much more than I ever gave him about topics within and beyond the ken of his formally described research interests. He is a wonderful team player and public citizen. He has strengthened the social sciences at Swarthmore, and through his teaching and research, he is actively making the world a better place. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Lorison to the stage. Hi, everybody. My sounds OK, right? There's a whole tech team back here. It's very fancy. Um, so I'm very glad to be here. And thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, I feel really lucky to get to be a faculty member here at Swarthmore, um, to get to be your colleague for a few more months, um, and to have gotten to be part of, uh, of, of our department with you. Um, and it's just an incredible, um, it's an incredible, I mean, you all probably have a sense of this, but it's an incredible place to get to be a student, and it's an incredible place to get to be a faculty member. Um, when I was, uh, when I was an undergrad here, I did not think I would be coming back. Um, I didn't even think I would go to graduate school, um, but Swarthmore prepared me incredibly well for thinking about the questions that it turns out I've wanted to dedicate my career to thinking about. Um, so let me tell you a bit about that. Um, this is a talk about the book that just came out this summer, Producing Politics, although I'll talk a little bit about um, some other research that I'm doing, uh, including with some students here. Um, and I'm really glad to get to talk to you about it. Um, so I think mostly when we think about 
politics, when we think about campaigns in this country, the first thing that we think about, and it makes a lot of sense, is the question of who holds the power of elected office, how campaigns might matter for that, um, who gets to be president, who gets to be in the Senate, who holds the majority in the Senate or in the House, um, and down through local elections. And that's, of course, an incredibly important question, um, especially as we're facing the midterms. Um, I'm thinking a lot about you know, who's, who's, which party is going to be in power and how that's going to matter. Uh, one way that certainly matters, um, I'm a transgender man. There's Republican governors across the country, especially in Texas and Florida, who are making it incredibly dangerous for trans youth and their families. I'm certainly concerned that that's something that's going to expand to making it even more difficult for trans adults as well. Um, you all can, I'm sure, think of other aspects of our politics that shape your lives, that shape the lives of people around you, uh, from questions of inequality to climate change to infrastructure um, to bodily autonomy um, and so on and so forth. So that's certainly one of the reasons I think it's important to pay attention to, to have, um, to study our political process. Um, but there's other reasons as well, and I want to talk to you about some of those. Um, and those have to do with the question of sort of what gets presented as politics, how people are learn to understand what politics is. Um, so this is just a collection of some ads uh, from 2008 through 2020 to give you a sense of what I mean. Um, you know, or for a more, even more recent example, I haven't found an image of this to put on the slides, but I've been driving my kid to roller derby practice up and down I-95 recently. Um, there's, I don't know if any of you saw them, but there's billboards all over the place, uh, uh, mostly anti-John Fetterman billboards, who's the Senate, Senate candidate. Uh, one of them says, Fetterman supports open borders, open jails, and open locker rooms, right? Um, so a lot of what campaigns do is try to give people a sense to give, you know, to make people think that the way they should understand their social world is either, you know, some people are out to get you, or, you know, here are some people who might be trying to help you solve your problems. The sociologist C. Wright Mills uh, has a term called the sociological imagination. And he talks about the, um, you know, in, in his vision, it's the role of the social scientist to help people connect the particular problems they might face, their individual troubles, their private um, struggles, to larger social structural issues, right? Um, I would love it, oops, I should stop banging that. I would love it if it were, in fact, social scientists who helped people make those connections. But in reality, for a lot of people, where they get their ideas about how their lives are shaped by larger forces is not from me, right? It's not from social scientists. It's a lot from political campaigns, right? Um, it's from these ads that say, if you're worried about your job, it's something about, you know, you should be concerned about all the quote unquote illegal immigrants coming into the country, right? Or if you're worried about your kids' experience with experiences in school and, your, and their safety, you should be mad at Larry Krasner, our DA, for um, putting fewer people in jail, right? Um, those are the kinds of messages that campaigns transmit that tell people this is how you should understand your life. Right? It's not the only place people get those ideas, certainly, but it's one place where they come from. And especially in times like this, in states that are competitive, they're all over the place. They suffuse the, you know, every ad you see. If you're watching Hulu with your kids, you see the billboards, you get the mailers, you get people knocking on your doors. So there's a lot of sort of content coming at people that's generated by political campaigns. Political campaigns don't just generate media, although that's a lot of what they do and a lot of where they spend their money. They also contact people, as I said, at their doors or on their phones. Um, and they don't do that in a way that is equal across different types of people. So this slide is showing you um, the percentage of people in each of five sort of broad in household income groups who report having heard from a campaign in 2020. Right? What you can see is that richer people, people in households earning over $100,000 a year, are about twice as likely, um, a, little less, a, you know, a little less than twice as, but about twice as likely to have heard from a campaign um, in the 2020 election cycle as people in the poorest households, those earning under $30,000 a year. 
Um, and for a lot of people who aren't, you know, most people who are sending their kids to Swarthmore, who are students at Swarthmore themselves, are, are following the news or sort of collecting political information themselves, most people are not those kind, that kind of sort of political hobbyist who pays a lot of attention. So for a lot of people, a knock at the door or not, a political ad um, that feels targeted to them or not is a big part of where they get their idea about what politics is and who it's for. Um, and campaigns are making these decisions about who to contact. If you understand anything about race and class in the United States, you should not be surprised that if there's economic inequality in something, there's also racial inequality in that same thing. Um, so that's what I'm showing here, is that uh, of you know, white people are also the most likely to report having heard from a political campaign of any of the major racial ethnic groups in the US. Um, and one thing we know about how campaigns work, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is that the single most effective thing that a campaign ever does is talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there's a ton of research on campaigns and how they matter. It's often very, very, very small effects, um, and there's often debates among political scientists about exactly how much anything matters. Uh, but can't, actual contact from a human being is one of the few things that's reliably been shown to increase the chance that somebody turns out to vote. Um, and so you know, when campaign contact is unequal, unequal, it increases the level of inequality among, uh, in political participation among people in the country. So to get a sense of where those decisions are coming from, um, I have done some research with people who run campaigns. Um, this is a selection of pictures of some of them. If you're the kind of person who really follows politics closely, you'll recognize some of these people. Some of them are people that I've interviewed. Some of them are people um, who I've just followed and uh, gotten a sense of them. Um, but you'll notice a couple things, hopefully, right off the bat. One is that they're disproportionately white and they're disproportionately men. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that they're important not just in terms of uh, the decisions they make in campaigns, but they often end up, as you can see in some of these pictures, being the face of elected officials, um, working in the White House if they've been on a su successful uh, presidential campaign, working in other kinds of uh, government offices for other kinds of elected officials. Um, so I talked to a bunch of these folks, and they're the people who did pretty much everything. You know, the people I spoke with have done pretty much every role in a campaign that shapes the ways that campaigns reach out to people. Um, so I've talked to campaign managers, I've talked to political directors, I've talked to communications directors and speech writers and field directors and so on and so forth. Um, so to put that a little more formally, this is one of my probably my, my most boring slide, but just to tell you sort of where this comes from. Um, uh, over the course of, this actually started as my dissertation, so I started doing interviews in 2010, actually the fall of 2009, um, and did interviews again when I got back to the US in 2017 and a few more in 2021. Um, uh, I talked to 72 people, I talked to 12 of them twice, so 84 interviews. Um, I found them a number of ways. One is that I worked on the Obama campaign in California in the fall of 2008 when I was in grad school, so I knew a bunch of people that way. Um, it also turned out that um, most people I knew from high school, nobody I knew from high school was connected to politics. I came from a fairly uh, working class family, um, but my partner's family knew a lot of people who were connected to politics, so through her and through their family, I was able to reach out to more people to do interviews with. I also just emailed, did some cold emails to people who were listed that there's a campaigns and politics magazine dedicated specifically to people who work in campaigns of their profession. It designates rising stars over the every year. I talked to some of those people. Um, all in all, I talked to a pretty even party split, 31 Republicans, 40 Democrats, one independent, um, 53 men and 19 women, 65 white people and seven people of color. Um, we could talk about that. This, um, especially when I started, the field was overwhelmingly white. It's gotten somewhat more diverse since then, at least on the Democratic side. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of the, the set of people. I usually interview people for about an hour, hour and a half, often in their offices in DC. I also put together a, a database of the careers of campaign professionals. Um, Sarah was very generous in talking about all the different methods I like to use. The downside is I was in grad school for a very long time collecting all this data. Um, 
when I put together a data set with every staffer who was named as a, in a role on a campaign um, from 2004 to 2020 on a presidential campaign. Um, there's this website, there's a guy who lives in DC who just basically makes it his life's work to collect everything he can about every presidential election um, from every ad to every speech to every staffer. It's all on this sort of ugly 1990s looking website um, and which is what you can see here. Um, and that's where I started in getting, collecting the names of people who worked in politics. Um, and then I looked other places, including um, LinkedIn, Ballotopedia, et cetera, um, in order to make sure I've got all the information I need about each of these people. Um, there's a sort of typical LinkedIn page. Campaign professionals are very on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I ended up with about 4,500 people in this data set. 2,000 of them, I have enough to sort of say something meaningful about who they are. Um, so with that, let me tell you what, what I found about people who work in politics. The first thing is that it's a strange, exclusive club. Um, and that's something that people I talked to said over and over again. Um, so Susan, for example, told me that people who work in politics are not normal people. Rufus said a lot of people in this field are odd, very odd people. Um, and Arthur said a lot of people in politics are the ones who ran for student council uh, president in high school or class secretary, and they've just got it in their blood. Um, so when, you know, when politicos, when campaign professionals say this to me, what they're saying is we're unusual because we're so into politics. Um, but they're also unusual in, in some other important ways. So let me take you through the career of one of the people I spoke with who I call Chris. Everybody uh, that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, if it's a cartoon, it, it, it's a pseudonym. I gave people the, the promise of anonymity when I talked to them, um, so they shouldn't be identifiable uh, either here or in the book. Uh, so Chris worked for his first campaign when he was 11. Um, he had a paper route and he would go around on his bike and he saw some, you know, a guy's name on all the yard signs and he thought that was the coolest thing he'd ever seen. Um, and he talked to that guy and ended up volunteering for him, uh, distributing his campaign literature while he was doing his bike route every day. Um, which I would guess the newspaper company wouldn't have approved of, but that's what Chris did. Um, at the end of that campaign, the guy who was working for won. He, took, he had a bunch of kids in the neighborhood working for him. He took them all to a fancy skating rink at the end of the campaign, and Chris was basically hooked. Uh, so all through campaign, all through um, college, and all through high school and college, he worked on campaigns whenever he had the chance. Um, and then when he graduated, he got his, first, his very first full-time job out of college was as a spokesperson for a family friend who was running for office. Um, so I want to pause here and say, you know, when you think about who has ample free time in high school and college to work, um, often for very little money, um, or often as a volunteer for a campaign, that's not equally distributed across people. Um, when you think about who knows someone who's likely to run for office, that's also um, really stratified by race and by class and by other things as well. Um, so Chris had access to those networks, and that's part of what got him into being able to work in politics. Um, the guy he worked for won, and so then he had a job after that campaign working in his office. Um, and then at a certain point he decided, this was a, a local or state level politician, he decided he wanted to work at the national level, which is actually a jump that not everybody is able to make, but he worked his network, and he told me that five different people uh, take credit for getting him a job in a congressperson's office. So he knew five people um, that he could connect with, that could connect him to this congressperson so that he could have a job in national politics and not just local politics. Uh, after that, he had a bunch of different political jobs, as people do. Uh, he ended up working on both of Romney's presidential runs. And um, as he was doing that, he was also a commentator on TV news. So that's another way that the people who work in campaigns sort of shape our political culture and our national culture is there are a substantial portion of the people that you see on the Sunday talk shows are commenting on what's happening in our politics. Uh, he's been on uh, any number of cable news shows. And then, um, 
after the after Romney lost for the second time, he decided he was done with campaign work and he worked at, moved into a public affairs and lobbying firm. And then a little while after that, he got a job, um, or at least last time I checked on what he was doing, he had a job in a high-powered philanthropy. And I put that in quotation marks because the goal of this foundation was not to give money to people who need it, but to uh, influence politics in the direction that the founders of the foundation wanted to see politics go. So he's still essentially working in politics, even though the job, the organization is technically a foundation. Um, so that's Chris. Again, you can see a number of points where this would be difficult for many people to access this kind of work. Let me show you some of how that ends up looking. Um, the first thing is the gender composition of people in campaigns. Um, so here, because uh, they didn't want to use the traditional colors, the women are the sort of lighter blue and the men are the darker blue. Um, and you can see that uh, yeah, I'm comparing Democratic voters on the far left to Democratic campaign staff and Republican voters to Republican campaign staff. And as you go from left to right, things just get more and more men, um, which is true overall. Uh, and you can see that there's, you know, the Democratic campaign staff are a bit more men than women, but at the level of all the people in campaigns, there's not a huge difference. Uh, the Republican campaign staff, however, are very disproportionately men. Um, but when you think about uh, sort of not just the whole staff, which is what these charts are about, but the top levels of, of the campaign organization, things look pretty different. Um, so this is Sarah, who I talked with, who was a Democrat. And she said it's definitely an old boys network still. There's definitely a piece where you have to fight through to be kind of considered part of that. The go-to guys are the guys. Um, yeah, I tried to, and they look a little bit like the people, but they're anonymized <laughs> other than that. Chris kind of does look like that. Um, <laughs> good question. Uh, you know, one of, one of the features of campaign work that people talk to me about a lot is that it's incredibly full on. You basically are expected to work. One person I talked with said, you know, I got my first job on a presidential uh, primary campaign. First of all, she had to drive from um, her home in Florida all the way to New Hampshire on her own dime. Second of all, she uh, was paid almost nothing. Third of all, she was told, you know, you'll work from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then it'll go to 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. and then it might get a little longer than that. She said, really, I was working basically 24 hours a day by the end of the campaign. That's very hard for anybody with family responsibilities to do. Um, so that's one of the things that drives um, women disproportionately out of campaign work and anybody who cares about being a reasonable parent or a reasonable partner. Um, one person I talked with said, if you go to the, the political consultants convention, it's basically a bunch of sad, old, lonely, divorced white guys. Um, uh, so that's sort of the gender aspect. Um, let me talk about the racial aspect of who's in campaigns. Um, so I've got three bar charts here. Um, the first one just shows you uh, roughly the racial makeup of US adults. So the blue is non-Hispanic white people, uh, the light blue. Um, and then pink is, is black or African American. Purple is Hispanic or Latinx. Uh, green is Asian, Asian American. Gray is everybody else. Um, so you can see that uh, voters are disproportionately white, which fits with uh, what you might expect. Um, and campaign staff are even more disproportionately white. Um, they're about 80% white overall. Um, but of course, if you have any understanding of the parties in the US, you will not be surprised that there's really different, really big differences in the racial composition of the two parties. Um, so I think it makes more sense to think about what campaigns look like this way. Um, so you can see, uh, the first two bars are just the same thing I showed you before, U.S. adults and then U.S. voters. And then you can see that Democratic voters look more like the country in terms of race um, than voters overall. They're, again, about 60% non-Hispanic white, but Democratic campaign staff are closer to 70% white. Um, Republican voters are very disproportionately white, um, and Republican campaign staff, there's not much room for them to be even more white than the voters, and yet they manage it by just a little bit. Um, and again, this is across the entirety of the campaigns, um, sort of above the it, anybody who's got a role that was big enough that I could find it. Um, but when you think again about the top of the campaign hierarchy, you start to see some different things. Um, so this is a picture of Simone Sanders. I didn't interview her directly, but um, I read an interview that she did on a podcast, and she's talking about what it's like to be a black woman at the top of Democratic campaigns where, where there's very, very few people of color. 
Um, and she said, I show up, um, I've got a, a, a curvy with a low cut, a bold lip, a chilling analysis. People don't know how to take it because I'm not supposed to be able to give you a solid political commentary with a bedazzled male. Right? So she's talking about sort of both the gendered and racial components of who gets, um, who gets taken seriously. Oops, I went, sorry, I went ahead by accident. She's talking about both the gendered and racial components of who gets taken seriously among people in, in the campaign world. Um, the last thing I want to show you uh, in terms of race is just drilling down to the democratic campaigns um, because that's the side that I care about most if I'm honest, but also the side um, that sort of makes an explicit commitment to racial inclusion. Um, and what I'm showing here is four of the sort of key areas that people in campaigns work in, um, the departments. Um, Three of them are maybe, or two of them at least, are, are straightforward. Field means people whose job it is to manage people going out and talking to voters or potential voters. Political is, uh, you know, when I first saw this, I was like, why are there political departments in political campaigns? That seems sort of redundant. Um, but what it basically means is people whose job it is to interface with particular communities. So in a political department on a campaign, there will be a director of African American outreach, there will be a director of LGBT outreach, there will be um, liaisons to particular communities. It's also part of their work to connect with politicians in the states and communities that they're working in. Um, and what you can see is that the political department ends up being where, the, um, where a substantial portion of Black and Latinx um, and uh, Asian American folks in campaigns are working. Um, whereas the communications department, which is in some sense the heart of a campaign, it's where the messages get developed, it's where the speeches get written, it's where the ads get decided on, um, is almost 80% white people. That's also the part of campaign work where you can make the most money if you're a consultant because of the way that ad purchasing works. Um, so that part is really disproportionately white. Um, and I talked to Diana, um, who uh, had been a field director a couple places, and she said there's definitely this thinking that if you're Latino, then you know they'll maybe only put you in states with a sizable Latino population, and that means less opportunities. Um, so again, there's sort of this uh, uh, winnowing of people into particular spots that means that the, the views of people of color are not necessarily getting into the sort of import, some of the important decisions that are made in, in campaigns about how to communicate, what to communicate, what to prioritize, etc. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you in terms of the distribution of people in this work is about the education. Um, so I partly like to show this just because I think it's important for people um, on a college campus to remember that having a college degree is actually a minority experience in the U.S. Um, only about 37, 38 percent of adults overall have a, a four-year college degree. Um, voters are a bit more likely to have a college degree than the population as a whole. Um, Republican voters are somewhat less likely to have a college degree than um, the, co the population as a whole. Democrats, it's about 50-50. Um, but both Republican and Democratic staff are far more likely to have bachelor's degrees than the people who you might think they're tasked with communicating with, the people who are potential voters. Um, and of course, I'm a, I should stop doing that. I'm a college professor. I love education. I think college is a great thing to do. Um, and I think that it's, you know, I want people whose job it is to think about the political direction of our country to have education wherever possible. So it's not necessarily that it's bad that they have degrees, but it certainly indicates a disconnect from the kinds of people that they're talking with. Um, and it's not a requirement of the job. The way that campaign careers work, um, basically when you first start, no, no matter what experience you have, no matter what education you have, they expect you to set up chairs or carry luggage or bring sandwiches or et cetera. Um, and you work your way up by showing that you're a person who can, who can work 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week and who is reliable um, and potentially has good ideas. Uh, so it doesn't really, you know, the college degree doesn't really uh, mean much to the people who are actually doing the work or, you know, D Susan said the fact that she happened to major in political science does jack shit for her in this business. 
And the last thing I want to think about in terms of who's doing this work is what kinds of colleges and universities they went to. Um, so Stanley told me, and I believe him, that he never asked anybody where they went to school. He always wants to know what campaigns they've been in. Um, he was a owner of a consulting firm, so he was doing a fair amount of hiring. Um, and yet, when we look at the kinds of colleges and universities that people went to, it's not at all representative of the, of the US. Um, so this is a little hard to see because the top few lines are so small for the US adults. So this is of people who've gone to college who are just a little bit younger than I am, born between 1980 and 1982. Um, about 4%. The little thin, tiny blue line up there plus the yellow line went to places like this or the Ivy League. That's what those two lines indicate. So those are the most, uh, most exclusive or sometimes we say highly rejective colleges and universities in the country. Um, those are the ones that you know, your kids all managed to get into. Um, they're also the ones where um, parental incomes on average are the highest, although we're doing what we can here in other places to shift that a bit. Um, so the median parental income of people who went to Ivy League colleges and universities in that cohort is, was about $170,000 a year, whereas the median household income overall is about $60,000 a year. Um, so there's a real class difference in who's going to the fancy colleges versus who's going everywhere else um, or not going to college at all. Anyway, that's my lecture about college selectivity. Um, what you can see is that the Democratic campaign staff, about 40% or about 10 times the rate in the population, went to these two most selective tiers of colleges and universities. Um, those, again, that blue and that yellow together at the top. Um, another 20% or a little bit more went to the highly selective colleges and universities. Those are often the sort of flagship campuses of the state university systems, so UCLA, University of Wisconsin-Madison, those sorts of places, as well as some private colleges and universities, um, uh, American University, for example. Um, and then the selective are not the, are, that's, they're not actually that selective. Um, so um, you still have to have gone, you know, finished high school, gotten some grades, but, um, and you can see that the, um, you know, the majority of people in campaigns went to these most selective colleges, and you know, I have talked about the parental ed income that that means they likely came from. Um, they're, you know, they're not similar to the people that they're working that they ought to be connecting with, right? Um, happy to talk about that more if you want, but I want to talk about why I think that matters. Um, so this is Diana again, and she talked about sort of what it takes to get a first job on a campaign. So Chris was, you know, he was extreme in some ways. Most people didn't start when they were 11, but he was sort of an archetype. He was, you know, most people did start in campaigns when they were very, very young, either in high school or right out of college. Um, uh, one person I spoke with who had started sort of in being really interested in politics and campaigns in the middle of college felt like she'd gotten a late start, to give you a sense of that. Um, so Diana says a lot of people get their foot in the door being interns in some way, which allows them to prove themselves and get known and get the check mark that they're okay, and then they get re recommended for campaign jobs. But she says, who are these people who can afford to work for free and live for free or, you know, without income for a few months? It's already a certain segment of the population. Another feature of the way that campaigns work is that they end, right? Um, so if you get a job on a presidential primary in the, you know, in the fall of an odd-numbered year, there's a reasonable chance that the person that you're working for is going to drop out of the race by January or February of the following year. And there's no guarantee that you have a job waiting for you if that happens. Um, so there's just a lot of uncertainty that is required to make a career in campaigns. Um, in my other book, The Class Ceiling, we talk about the sort of bank of mom and dad. We say mom and dad because it's a UK book. Um, but you know, the ways that people with resources from their families are able to take a lot more risks and advance their careers a lot more effectively because they have that cushion to fall back on. And that's certainly something we see in campaigns. Or Susan, who's one of my nice, uh, straightforward uh, interviewees, just says being involved in this work kind of type of work is almost like a luxury. Um, so Rufus, uh, when I asked him about who does this type of work, he said that the people who are making these decisions you know, they're odd, but one of the ways that they're odd is that they have a good sense of what's effective. They have a good sense of how to communicate with regular people. Um, and I think if we, you know, if, if we thought that the people in campaigns 
were absolutely doing the right thing all the time, then maybe we wouldn't care so much about who was making those decisions. Right? Maybe it would be OK if it's mostly white people and it's mostly people from Ivy Leagues. We'd still care in terms of sort of democracy or representation, but it maybe wouldn't matter so much in terms of what kinds of politics we get. Um, but I don't think that's the case for a, a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but one is that it's actually really, really hard to know what decision in a campaign is going to have what effect on the outcome. Um, there's reams of political science research where people are trying to figure out, did, you know, does having more ads make a difference? Does one kind of message in an ad work better than another kind of message in an ad? Is if, there's a, if there's a big gaffe or a big scandal, does that affect the outcome? And for almost all of those kinds of studies, the best estimate of how much something matters is basically zero. Um, so this is a quote from a meta study by political scientists Josh Kella and David Brockman. Um, and they looked at 49 field experiments, and that was their conclusion, that our best guess for how much campaigns, you know, a wide variety of things campaigns do can influence the outcome is zero. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that if one side ran a campaign and the other side stayed home, you would expect that it wouldn't matter. Um, part of why the estimate is zero is because of what one of my interviewees called mutually assured destruction, right? Um, they both are just doing as much as they possibly can, and in the end, it kind of cancels itself out. Um, so when campaign professionals think about how much their work matters, how they affect outcomes, um, they kind of get this. So I talked to Todd, uh, who was a Republican pollster. And he was working on a, a special election for a Senate race uh, with a sort of long shot Republican candidate uh, in 2010. And he said, if we win, it will definitely be because we had the superior strategy. But just a few minutes later in that same conversation, he said, if, you know, consultants are always wanting to take credit for it. Um, but at the end of the day, there's so much that we can't control. Um, the way the race closes, the definition of momentum is out of our control. And that's sort of like, we make the difference, or we really don't. That, that's a, how a lot of people in campaigns talked about it, right? Um, they wanted to believe that they, what they were doing was the most effective thing they could possibly do. Um, they used the best data and the best research they had access to, the best polling, et cetera. Um, but those of us who are paying attention in 2020 know that polls do not always give us a really good read on what's going to happen. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, they mostly felt like they used their intuition, their guts, their sort of practical sense of what works. Um, and they were aware of this. So they told me it would be impossible to know for sure who's good at campaigning. Um, people fall for marketing and personal relationships or who they know. At the end of the day, you have to use your gut. Um, or <sighs> Sophia. Um, said something similar. She was talking to me about an ad that uh, was designed by someone in her firm, and they were talking about whether it was a good ad or a bad ad. And he, this guy who designed it, it was for an older candidate, and he said he thought it was an establishment, sort of power broker ad was what was being evoked in these images. Um, but she says he had a tin ear for this stuff. She, just, she says, we just had totally different reactions. Um, now there's no way to evaluate who's right and who's wrong. But she said the ad didn't resonate with where the electorate was at. There's no way to know, but I was right. right? Um, and that's the kind of thing I heard from a lot of people. So you know, when people complain about campaigns, as they often do, um, they have sort of two ideas about what's wrong with our campaigns or how they should be different that I, that are, I see over and over again. This is also true in the sort of academic literature. Um, so one argument is that campaigns are, campaign professionals do know what they're doing, right? They're essentially masterminds. They take all the data at hand and they figure out how to manipulate people, right? That's the argument that you heard about Cambridge Analytica in 20, uh, 2016 and 20, oh, right, the polls were off in 2016, not 2020. It's been a long time since then. Anyway, um, uh, you know, they take all the data at hand, they, they figure out, um, they use their sort of masterful analysis and social media tricks and all of that, and they manipulate us into doing what they want, right? Um, the Victory Lab, which is by another Swarthmore alum, Sasha Eisenberg, um, who was on a panel with me a little while ago, um, you know, he talks about all these experiments that campaigns are doing, and they're getting better and better at figuring out what's effective, what's less effective, at figuring out how to target individual peoples, to use uh, 
uh, sort of micro-targeting or other newer modeling techniques to figure out who's most susceptible, who's most persuadable, who's most likely to vote, how, who they should focus on. That's all true. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said, a lot of what it comes down to is gut sense. Um, and I put that book next to The Election Men, which was written in 1972, so 40 years before Vic the Victory Lab. It also argues that campaigns are getting better and better and better at figuring out how to, how to use data and computers and so on to manipulate people, although the tone of that book is that is is being worried about democracy for that reason, whereas the tone of Sasha's book is more like, woohoo, campaign analytics. Um, but I don't think masterminds is a really good way of understanding why campaigns do what they do. I don't think they actually can figure out the best strategy in all situations. And so I think it matters whose gut instincts are making are sort of informing what campaigns do. The other thing you hear that I want to address just briefly is, the, is that it's all about money. They're essentially mercenaries. They're just trying to earn as much as they can, line their pockets. Um, it's all a grift. Um, and people are just going away and making a ton of money. Now, at the top of campaigns, the, the sort of general consultants, the people whose names you've heard, um, there's absolutely people making unbelievable amounts of money working in, in campaigns. But that's not most of them. And most of them who are doing that sort of started out on the bottom making very little. And that's not, for most of them, why they're there. Um, and I think I'll show you a bit about that in a, on the next slide. But I also want to say um, you know, the amount of money isn't the main thing determining what kinds of things campaigns do. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more if you want. Um, but I also want to show you Lindsay, um, who I asked him at the end of our interview, is there anything else you want me to know about how campaigns work, about how this world works? And he said, if the goal was simply to make money, I'd be in commercial market research. There's a lot more money in commercial market research. Um, people like me do what we do because we believe that the people we helped elect will make a difference for the country. Um, he said, I don't give a damn whether the toothpaste box is green or red. I just don't. But I care a whole lot about who gets on the Supreme Court. I care a whole lot about who gets to be president. I think it makes a whale of a difference who gets to be president. Um, so if they're not just sort of making decisions based on money, and they're not making decisions based on um, you know, purely on science or sort of rational calculation of what's going to move whom, how should we understand what campaigns do? Um, my answer to that is this, um, which partly is just there because I almost named the book The Room Where It Happens, and I want to sort of keep that in the talk, um, partly just for a little color, um, but also because a lot of what's happening in campaigns is they're paying attention to who's around them, what their ideas and beliefs are about what's effective, and sort of how to impress the people that are in the room with them. Um, so I interviewed Ethan uh, in 2017, and he'd seen uh, Hamilton the night before fairly recently with his kids. And he said the room where it happens was just a wonderfully universal rendering of the ambition of those of us who don't necessarily run for things. You want to be in the room where that decision is made, where the deal is cut on Capitol Hill. Um, so what you get when I talked to people um, about campaigns and about their work, um, I very rarely heard them talk to me about voters, about regular people and how they see politics. I heard some, but what I most often heard was about sort of sticking it to the other side, about competition among people in campaigns. So that's why I chose these images, because they sort of get at that dynamic that a lot of what campaigns are doing is attending to one another rather than figuring out how to be a connection between regular people and the world of politics, which I think they could and should be. Um, so um, I'll give you one academic quote, which is from my favorite dead French guy, Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and he says, the political field is the field in which through the competition between the agents involved in it, that's the camp among other people, that's the campaign professionals that I'm talking to you about, all of our political world gets produced, right? And that means that citizens are, in some sense, reduced to the status of consumers and have to choose among those different political products. Um, and that's more and more difficult the further they are from the world of politics. Right. Um, so let me, um, I'm going to skip this one, actually, and, and tell you a little bit about sort of what that means for our, our campaigns and our democ democracy. And then I'll take some questions. Um, so I just want to point out um, that all of this about who's doing this work and how they understand the work they're doing 
doesn't just matter for campaigns. It also matters because people who work in campaigns end up sort of throughout the world of, of political power. Um, so almost half of people who are in my data set have worked in a government job, often in the White House, um, or for a senator or for a congressperson, also sometimes in the executive branch in various other places. They also work for party organizations, they work for corporations, uh, they work as consultants, they're sort of all throughout the world of politics. And the approaches that they take are not necessarily the best approaches either for democracy or necessarily for being effective at winning elections. Um, so Jerry, who was leaving politics as I talked to him, said that there's a pervasive cover your ass mentality in politics as well as in government. It's incredibly limiting. The default is inertia. Campaigns seem so cookie cutter because it's the same people over and over again using the same methods and techniques. Um, and he went on, this is my longest quote, he said the way the political, he didn't say political field, that's my term, but he said it breeds institutionalized mentalities, perpetuates this sort of formulaic thinking, which I think is one of the death knells and why people hate politics. It's this bullshit recycling of the same rhetoric on both sides. It's incredibly stifling to anything that's creative or innovative. I think it leads to re running really mediocre campaigns, and I think it's bad for the larger democratic system. And I'll give you just a couple examples of what that looks like. Um, one is that our, you know, our democracy does not include everybody. Um, so in 2020, we had the highest turnout we've had in uh, something like uh, 50, 60 years. I think since 1964. That's longer than 60 years. You get the idea. Um, uh, I can't do arithmetic live anymore. Um, anyway, still, um, it was also the first time that more people voted for the winner than stayed home since, again, I think 1964, but just barely, right? So 33.9% uh, of people who are eligible didn't vote, 34% of people who are eligible voted for Biden, 31% of people voted for Trump. Um, what's more typical, though, is what it looked like in 2016, which is that close to uh, over 40% of people who are eligible stayed home. And the people who stay home stay home in part because of the inequality that I showed you in the beginning and who gets contacted for campaigns. So this is a sort of schematic about how campaigns decide who to talk to and who not to talk to. Um, the X's mean we don't bother with them. This is from the Democratic perspective. Um, and they never send uh, canvassers, essentially, to people who never vote. They also don't send canvassers, usually, to people who are at the low end of the sort of predictive scores that they generate about probability of voting. Um, so what that means is that the people who are less likely to vote don't get contacted, and then they're less likely to vote than they otherwise would be if they had been contacted, and you get the sort of cycle of inequality and political participation. Um, and then we get an electorate, a set of people who voted that doesn't look like the people who stayed home. Um, so this is showing you the income and the racial composition of non-voters and of voters. Um, voters are more white and they're more rich um, than people who stay home by quite a bit. And I'll just talk to you very briefly about uh, the research project I'm working on right now with the Carnegie Fellowship, uh, which is doing interviews with poor and working class people across Pennsylvania with a bunch of Swarthmore students who've come through the summer research opportunities um, and worked with me over the summers. And then I also have a lab uh, working with me during the semesters and also with community-based community researchers who come from the communities that we're doing interviews in. Um, and I asked, we asked pretty much everybody, when you think about someone who's really into politics, who do you picture? And a lot of people say something that has to do with class and or race. Um, and so Joe, for example, said, um, I just imagine someone who wears a suit all the time, a very clean cut looking person. I wouldn't imagine an average everyday sort of person being very involved. And we heard that from a lot of different people in different ways. So Carlina said business people, people that are in good high paying jobs, Union workers, which we don't associate with the same class position, but it's true they vote at higher rates than people not in unions. Um, doctors, lawyers, people of that nature. Richard just said more educated people. And Nahim also said suit and tie. Um, head up, shoulders up, sh you know, everything straight, talking loudly yet clearly. So really sort of class and, and gendered vision of who's really into politics. 
And I don't think that our politics has to work this way. I don't think our politics has to be a thing that only sort of upper middle class and white people are really engaged in and excited about, and a lot, not only, right, but disproportionately. Um, and that everybody else feels like is this sort of abstract, distant uh, thing that doesn't, doesn't connect to them, or that is sort of dirty and it's elites fighting. That's another thing I heard from a lot of people. You could have a model. Um, this is from a Theta Scotchpole book, actually, um, about the Farm Bureau at the beginning of the 20th century. But what the image is trying to get at is that there is a model of communication between the top levels and the community level. Um, so it's an image of streets. Um, and the cars are going in both directions. And they're connected from the community level to the county level to the state level to the national level. Right? And in the machine era of US politics, we had something similar in many places um, with lots and lots of problems. But the job of a political operative in some systems is not to sort of broadcast a one-way message of whatever they think the most effective ad is to whatever they think the, um, the sort of target demographic is, but to make a connection, a two-way connection between people and politics. Um, so you know, we could have that, and we don't. Um, a couple of sort of implications of this research, and then I'm happy to take questions for a few minutes. Uh, one is that, you know, uh, this is, you know, for people who are in sort of academia, one thing we think about in sociology is how professions respond in uncertainty. Um, this is something that it's not only campaigns that have to deal with, although I think there's more uncertainty in campaigns than lots of people think. Um, I think it's also important to attend to the role of experts and intermediaries. We often just sort of pay attention to what the politicians are doing, but most of what they're doing is informed, if not shaped or directed entirely, by their staff and by their consultants. Um, and that a lot of our politics comes from the decisions that these people are making. I also would just argue that campaigns are a big part of the story of low participation and inequality in our politics. They're not the only thing that shapes that, but they're part of it. Um, and that campaigns could do things differently, even without changes in campaign finance laws or other election processes. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening to me. Yeah. And I think I could do like five minutes of questions or so. Yeah, I saw you first. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, are, are Stacey Abrams and Joe Kennedy and other people like that doing something different? Um, so short answer, yes. I think there, you know, there, are, um, there are campaigns that try to do more organizing with people. I think it matters who's at the head also. So just the fact that she's a black woman trying to organize in a, a, a state with a lot of black people makes a big difference in terms of who's likely to turn out. Um, but I think there's also still this conventional wisdom among most people in democratic campaigns that you that ads are sort of where it's at and that organizing is, a, is an add-on. Um, so I think there's lots more work to be done, but there are places like that where things are shifting a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, you there, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in terms of ads, I, th I mean, I think one thing we're seeing in our politics is that there's uh, a number of components of the Republican Party who are more willing to be more explicitly racist than they had been for at least 10 or 20 years. Um, and so that's a, 
I wouldn't say it's a radical shift, but it's a shift, right? Um, in terms of the, the tone and the content of some of the ads. Um, in terms of the, um, the racial composition, um, my data is mostly people who've worked at the national level, so I can't, you know, there's some, uh, you know, in, in some places there's some more representation, um, but what's actually happening is that more and more local races are having national consultants come in um, who are disproportionately white and also who don't know the area. Um, so they're sort of giving this sort of standard approach to campaigning and not really listening to the people who are from there who, who know the communities. Um, so I think it's, if anything, at the local level, there's at least some indications things are going what I would say is the wrong direction. One more question. Um, yeah, I saw you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question was sort of the, the educational composition of the campaign staff is fairly similar, but the voters are getting more and more split, right? Um, so we're seeing a, more, a bigger alignment between people, white people without college degrees are more and more voting for Republicans, um, and white people with college degrees are more and more voting for Democrats, and that's sort of where the split is. It's really different among, pe uh, among people of color, right? Um, so I think that, um, you know, I think there's lots of things about sort of how campaign professionals understand people that's shaped by who they are and where they come from. Um, and I think the instincts of a lot of campaign professionals with college degrees are not, I don't think are the right ones in terms of how to reach the people the, you know, the people who don't have college degrees. There's always a debate after every election about sort of, do we need, you know, there's, there's sort of these two sides in the Democratic Party after every election, especially the losses. And one side says, we need to be less woke, right? Left, there's a terrible word with lots of baggage, but whatever, we need to, we need to be less in favor of the gays in the 2010s, we need to be less anti-racist, we need to be less inclusive of transgender people now, we need to be less of all of these things because we're losing people, you know, this exact sort of white people without college degrees. There's a side that says we need to be bolder and more inclusive and, and more sort of stand in our values and be more clear about that. Um, you know, I lean towards that second side, but I think, you know, most of the people on both side of that, sides of that argument are not connected to communities where people don't have a lot of college degrees, um, where people are struggling. And so they're, they're both on some levels guessing based on the people they know and what would be effective for them. So I think we need, you know, if I were, if I could sort of prescribe one thing, it would be a sort of a massive effort at community organizing and engagement rather than just ads. Most people see ads and they say, I know that those are just trying to sway me and I'm not going to pay attention to them. So thank you. I think if you want the book, they're outside, so I'll be outside with the books.